Have you ever wondered where visual resource management and landscape design came from in British Columbia? Hi, my name is Garnet Muro, and for the next little while, I'm going to share a little bit about my history with visual resource management and some of the history in British Columbia. So let's get started. So because we're going to spend a little time together, I thought it would be a good idea to share a little bit about who I am and some of my history. So Henry Miro, Grandpa, was a settler. He came over from Russia in the mid-1920s, and when he wasn't settling on the farm, he was up north in Saskatchewan uh, logging. So Grandpa owned the horses, and amongst other things, he could uh, knit so he could fix their clothing. And I still remember all the stories uh, Grandpa sharing with me, you know, little things like, Oh, what'd you eat in the daytime? Well, they would take a tin of lard and some homemade bread, and uh, that was dinner. Sounds delicious, right? So anyway, got me interested in forestry, and after going to college at Selkirk College and then taking my degree at University of Alberta, I started my career with the Ministry of Forests over in Lillooet. After a couple years there, I ended up working with Ainsworth Lumber in Lillooet, and after a 10-year stint in Lillooet, I moved and ended up working for Gilbert Smith Forest Products in the, uh, the upper North Thompson River. So after Gilbert Smith, a couple years there, uh, I spent the next 10 years with my own firm, uh, Lindber, which stands for Lindsay and Birch, my children. Uh, for the past three years now, I've been working with Foresight Consultants, and here I am today. So landscape design, visual resource management. This is not a new concept for forestry or forest management. I just roll the clock back a little bit and let's talk about Canada's first Prime Minister, John A. Macdonald. Uh, during his tenure, they, he established the uh, National Park System. And it was through the, uh, what were their names? Uh, the McCardle uh, brothers and uh, Frank McCabe. Yeah, Frank McCabe. So they had found the Cave and Basin Hot Springs in Banff. And it was through this that they talked about the beauty and the scenic landscape in our country. So the importance of the national parks. Of course, also McDonald was responsible for linking the country through a railway system, one railway system. So everybody there in that photo is standing on beautiful wood. Guess what? The railway created a demand, a monetary demand for wood. So no longer was it in the way. Now, fast forward ahead to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, very famous uh, Prime Minister, our seventh Prime Minister. Uh, some of you more recently would think of him as either Spock or Severus Snape, but he actually was the Prime Minister that started the Canadian Forest Service due to the, uh, the increased demand for the surveys that we needed and the fires, the forest fires that were burning in Canada. Around the same time frame, Friedrich Weyerhaeuser brought in the concept of sustainability around 1900 and H.R. McMillan soon after became the first chief forester of British Columbia when the British Columbia Forest Service was established in 1912. Now, bringing it into the context of visual resource management, um, we really have to stand on the shoulders of the giants before us, right? You know, this is, this is uh, many people before us made it what is today. So uh, I'm going to bring up this book here. This is the uh, Landscape Aesthetics book from the Uni United States Forest Service. Uh, started back in the 1970s, believe it or not, and um, Professor Burton Litton there from the California Berkeley University was uh, instrumental in this uh, back in the early 70s, and the U.S. Forest Service hired him to bring that into, into the fray there. Now, uh, the British Forestry Commission was also very active in that uh, field, landscape design field, and so uh, Dame Sylvia Crow was one of the first pioneers in, in the British Forestry Commission, and then Simon Bell followed um, after her. Now, within British Columbia, we've got uh, key players such as Jacques Marc and Stephen Shepard at University of British Columbia, and locally in the Kamloops area, we had Peter Rennie for many, many years. Uh, all these individuals were instrumental in bringing visual resource management to us. Uh, we've got the handbook here, Forestry Handbook, 1981. Uh, so Pem Van Heek was the uh, director of um, Landscape Management Program uh, back in 1978. So this was, uh, the handbook was one of his products and all the way through to 1987, he was in charge of that program. Back then, of course, visual resource management was, was more or less off the corner of people's desks, but 
It was done within each district with the recreation officers. Uh, in the book, of course, they've got a great picture of Black Home. I love showing this one, 1981. But also, what's important here is that uh, right on the front cover, right on the front cover of the book, it says, we must deal with the reality that in a province heavily dependent on its forest products and as rugged and as mountainous as British Columbia, the evidence of logging activity cannot be hidden from views. So, again, the idea that visual resource management is to be hidden, it's just a, it's just a myth. Ultimately, we're supposed to see the logging. It's a beautiful thing, and we need to wear that on our sleeves. You know, be proud of the work we do out there and, and use the landscape design principles. It's not about hiding logging. It's about really showcasing it, in, in my mind. So, 1994, uh, let's, let's look at some more publications here. Basically, in 1994, the publication on the first look of visual effect of green up came out. Again, reaching out to the public. What it's, you know, it's one thing to think what foresters think, but what, is, what does the public think? Because it is a public resource that we're managing for. So again, the publications that came out, I'll just go through a few of them here. Uh, 1994, the, the Roadshow of uh, Landscape Design Training. So here's the manual. Uh, I attended the very first session of this. Uh, with Simon Bell being the uh, the primary instructor, so Simon came over from the British Forestry Commission. Uh, he helped us get this thing, get the ball rolling here in BC. And Jacques and Peter and I know uh, other folks like Luke and uh, Luke Roberge and uh, Lloyd Davies are very involved with uh, with the rollout of this program. Uh, along came the Forest Practices Code, uh, 1994ish, or so somewhere around there. Uh, very early in my career. But, uh, you know, it was in response to a lot of, uh, I guess, you know, public uh, disappointment with forest practices. So the forest practices code came out where they're going to, you know, enforce things really hard, you know. But a lot of good things came out of this, you know, the, ins the visual impact assessment guidebooks were a big part of this. 1995 was the first edition and then subsequently in 2001 it was revised and updated. 1996, we've got a clear-cutting uh, public perception study done. Again, trying to get the science behind what we're trying to do out there. So following up with the clear cut is the partial cut and some standards on landscape inventories, visual landscape inventories, very important. Around 2001, well it was in 2001, there was a uh, conference, a visual landscape design conference, uh, visual stewardship on the working forest. Now, because of my history and experience with Ainsworth Lumber in the Lillooet area and the Woodlands, the entire Woodlands group there, we work very, very hard on this. Uh, again, Lillooet was one of the first areas in the province to have an established scenic area and visual quality objectives. So I guess we just had to get into it. There was really no choice. Um, so I came in as a guest speaker for this conference, a uh, very well attended conference and uh, you know, internationally attended by speakers and uh, presenters and attendees. Uh, again, more public perceptions and this time from an economic perspective of the recreation and tourism side of things, 2003. Uh, by 2005, there was a, you know, such a strong uh, positive feedback from the first conference that a second conference was held on landscape design. And this one was more on the public expectations, operational challenges and integrate, uh, international perspectives. Again, looking at what, what are other people in other countries doing? So once again, I was invited as a guest speaker and I introduced the concept of fractals and uh, operational design with, uh, with this presentation. 2006 came out another publication on uh, public, public's response to uh, landscape level stuff. Now I want to draw your attention just for a moment uh, to the center picture in this, uh, in this uh, cover picture here. And back when I was working at Ainsworth, we actually were brought up before the Forest Practices Board investigation uh, for a special investigation uh, for meeting uh, for partial retention visual quality objectives. And that photo in the middle is, is, represents our work uh, with Ainsworth, uh, the whole Woodlands group there. Uh, 2008, uh, visual quality effectiveness evaluations, uh, you know, again, with FERPA now in, in the, FERPA now in sort of our regulatory environment, we're looking at, you know, how do we monitor this stuff? So 2010, again, in response to what was really uh, unprecedented in our province with the uh, mountain pine beetles sort of really taking hold in 2003 and running its course through the province, uh, there needed to be uh, some kind of a look at what are the impacts uh, and what does the public perceive as acceptable and not acceptable. Again, 
let's get some science behind this. And 2011, uh, one of the shortcomings of this training here in the manual was that, uh, you know, what do you do right adjacent, directly adjacent to roadsides? So this was a first look at, you know, putting some, some real thought behind what is it uh, we can do and what does the public perceive as acceptable and not acceptable. And most recently, uh, we're looking at things beyond forestry. What are the other impacts on this land base that we have? And so wind energy. Now, is it going to happen? Well, absolutely. Here's a photo I took uh, just this summer, this past summer of 2016, going over to Kelowna on the Kogala connector from Merritt to Kelowna. So, of course, we do have wind, ener wind energy coming along uh, in our areas. So what's driving this and why? Why does it matter? I mean, we, we really have to ask those, those questions too. So the AAC in British Columbia, uh, 73 million, just shy of 73 million. What's the total area? Well, just around 94 million hectares. But the productive land, 48 million, and we you take some net downs, blah, blah, blah. We're at a timber harvesting land base of 23 million hectares. In countless TSA, we've got about 2.3 million hectares, or sorry, 2.3 million meters cubed for the AAC. Now, why is this important? Well, this is the government's direction. This is what the government tells licensees to go do. It's licensees' responsibility, tenure holders' responsibility to get out of the land base and cut the cut. So this is the driver. This is what drives everything. So going back, Again, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, my experience and sort of, you know, where I come from. Yeah, this is back in like the early 1990s. Uh, the fellow in the front is Bernie Venko and in the back is Dalton MacArthur. Uh, Dalton's a little bit frustrated with me right there because I just finished, uh, we just finished hiking all day in a pouring rain. And uh, I had earlier put a nice five pound rock into his backpack. So he carried that along with him all day and just discovered it after this photo was taken. So pretty good time. Uh, anyway, Dalton was a very strong advocate of um, visual resource management. He was a recreation officer in the Loet Forest District. And, uh, you know, I think he was, he was one of the catalysts for, you know, getting scenic areas and visual quality objectives established in the province, one of the, one of the two forest districts that actually did it, uh, Horsefly being the other one. And Dan Donaldson was the uh, district manager at the time in Lillooet. And I, I still remember that because we had conversations about, well, what, what does partial retention mean? Um, and so this was one of the first proposals that, uh, you know, we were facing as a, you know, as a group. And again, I was right out of university. So this was all sort of like, okay, I'll just read this. Um, and so there was the proposal, and it's out in Braylorn, and, and the, the visual quality objective for this area was partial retention. Obviously, that wasn't going to work, that proposal. So let's back it up again. Looking at um, your experience and where you're coming from makes a difference, what your belief system is. So on the left, the, you know, the fellow is saying, I think this clear cut fits the landscape really well. Well, on the right, if you look carefully, that's actually Simon Bell putting himself into the manual. Well done, Simon. Uh, well, I don't think this fits the landscape at all. So whether you're coming from Vancouver or Clearwater, or looking out from Dutch Lake or from Saskatchewan, your belief system is going to be different because of your environment where you grew up. Which leads me to one of the best formulas that someone ever taught me was T plus F plus A equals R. Our thoughts lead to our feelings, which gives us our actions, and then gives us our results. So it's the inner game versus the outer game, all right? So thoughts plus feelings equals actions, which equals results. So going back, you know, your thoughts from, uh, your thoughts from Vancouver or, your, you know, where are you from? They're gonna, they're gonna drive what your feelings are, which is gonna give you different actions. So their belief system is going to come from what they see. You know, forest management is based on what do they see. Here's here's the deal. Like what they see is it's 87%, and this comes right out of the training manual. Okay, so the science behind it is proven. Now, so is it the eye of Sauron? No, it's not. Not at all. Now, again, this, this summer we were in uh, England, and we went to the natural. Uh, uh, history Museum and and this is some of the artwork that's being displayed and I and for me I don't quite get it 
All right. But I do get this. I love the humor of a, of a farmer. And, you know, if you're traveling between Clearwater and uh, Barrier, you know, th this changes all the time. Th these bales are always dressed up a little bit different. So I love it. And I think it's fantastic. And so it brings me to my next point here is that your perceptions and your belief system. So, you know, if, you, if you're a farmer, you love this, you've got a great crop, uh, you're going to bale it up. It's going to be fantastic. Um, if you're coming from the city, you look at this and you go, oh, that's wonderful. A, a, a beautiful little farm area. As a forester, I look at it and I go, well, where's the trees? Where's the trees in this picture? Well, they're gone. Um, so there's no more uh, production of trees on this land base. Well, that's too bad. I, I think you can grow great trees here. But again, my belief system is different, and everyone's is. And, of course, we're in a global market, so it, it does matter. Um, here in the Camus area, we've got Sun Peaks, and folks come from all over the world, and they come from local areas too. So the belief systems matter here too. Uh, eventually, we're all going to end up in a uh, public meeting and we're going to answer the questions to the public. So we need to know what is their belief system and we need to listen. We have to listen to what the public says about the management of our forests because it's so important. Without that, we have nothing. So 2004, FERPA comes along, uh, the code gets thrown away. Well, not thrown away, but we moved over into the FERPA world. And the way I look at this is that, you know, each one of these 11 values that we're managing for, well, they're all interconnected. There's no way that you can manage for just one in isolation of the other. Um, you know, timber production is important. Absolutely. We've got this cut. We've got to go get. Cut the cut, right? But there's all the other resource values to manage for. And ultimately, our role as forest professionals is to find that balance. What's the balance of all these different 11 values? So let's look at visuals, visual quality for a moment. It's a resource value that is managed in designated scenic areas, okay? And there's enhanced definitions around the VQO here, and it's location, scale, and shape. So this is all new in the FERPA world coming out of the code. And if you're wondering, okay, in my area, how did I get a VQO? Well, here's a nice little flow chart on the different ways that VQOs were established in your area. Pay attention to this slide. This is really important. Uh, and I know you can still order these or find this online, but it's a, it's a quick guide to visual quality objectives. And in a recent Forest Appeals Commission case, uh, this was used as sort of a barometer as far as percent alterations and, and you know how things should look. So this is a very good um, slide to, to have in your back pocket here, okay? Uh, but again, it's, it's FERPA, it's visual quality objectives, and it's the current, you know, where we're at today. Now, perceptions matter. You know, it depends on where you're from and how you look at things. You're either looking at a beautiful woman here or someone playing a saxophone, but at the end of the day, people see things differently. All right, this brings us to the end. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you listening to this, and I really look forward to spending some time in the classroom with you. Now it's your turn. I would, what I'm asking you to do is to just write down a few thoughts or uh, you know some of your experience as to what visual resource management means to you and what some of your experience is uh, in British Columbia. So go ahead, download the document uh, below this video, and you'll be able to fill it in. And then what I'm asking you to do is please just send that back to me uh, you know a little bit about who I am, some of my experience, and what's really going to help me is to understand who you are, and so I have a better understanding of who's going to be in the room with us uh, you know, when we do the session at the end uh, coming up. So, I'm Garnet Mural. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you on the next video.